so first first and foremost you know thanks thanks so much um for everybody wanting to um to, to take time out to attend today's event. Fantastic opportunity for us um, to make Kickstart an absolutely fantastic scheme in, in Greater Manchester. Um, so I'm Matt Ainsworth, the Assistant Director for Employment at the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. And we've got a number of a number of, of, of people speaking uh, speaking today uh, to give both a, a, a local perspective on, on, on Kickstart. And I'm really pleased that uh, Mo Isap, who's a co-chair of the Greater Manchester LEP, and a member of our Employment and Skills Advisory Panel um, will, will, be, will be kicking off today, today's event with a strategic overview of, of what, what we think this means for Greater Manchester. Um, fantastic that we have um, Garant Williams from uh, DWP um, on, the, on, on today's session to talk about the, um, actually the, the mechanics of the, of, the, of, the, of the scheme itself, um, how, it, how it's been, how, it's work, how it will work, the role of the gateway, the role of the, of the work coach, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of, plenty of questions to ask um, uh, Garant. And then um, Elizabeth Taylor from URSA, uh, so the Employment Related Service Association, uh, who, who many of you will, will, will know, will give a kind of URSA perspective in terms of what, what good looks like um, for, for Kickstart and how it can truly, um, can truly deliver, deliver what, what, we, what everybody would want it to. Uh, and then a Greater Manchester perspective in terms of um, the, the role that we, we see um, local, local partners playing in terms of stewarding a quality um, kickstart program for greater for greater manchester and and some of the some of the um the mechanisms we're putting in place to ensure to ensure uh, that happens as much as, as much as possible i want to ensure there's plenty of plenty of time at the end for for q a um so we'll, we'll have a panel discussion so that's where um, if any any questions have been posted in the chat function throughout the throughout the morning we'll look to pick them up in that in that session and also take take questions from the um from the floor um, and then hopefully generate some good good discussion. Now, I'm conscious we won't be able to answer all queries today. Um, so we'll also uh, at, at the end of today just just leave some information in terms of in terms of next steps, further information, and where where we we can we can we want to go to next with this. So so finally, you know, thanks again so much for for attending attending today. Um, really keen to get your views um, about about the program as much as I'm sure you are to hear about uh, hear about the the national and the local perspective uh, on this. But without without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Mo Isaac, who's the co-chair of the Greater Manchester Lab, just to just to share some of his thoughts in terms of why Kickstart is so important for Greater for Greater Manchester. So so Mo, I'm going to hand over to hand over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew. And and from from us again, uh, you know, good morning to everybody. And and I think the fact that we're trying to break Microsoft Teams could, may not be a bad thing uh, in the current climate. I'm sure many of us have have now had a saturation point with having uh, Teams calls on an endless basis. But it's just great to see the number of people attending today because it just shows the commitment and the appetite to making sure that. A program as significant as Kickstart actually can make a difference, and 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 really, you know, my few minutes today is about you know setting the intention. Really, I think you know we all know whether we're in business or in public service that you know the greater the intention, the greater the outcome. And really, today is about setting out the intention for Greater Manchester, and it's great to see the Greater Manchester family come together in this way, and we will continue to work together. And as you will see throughout this presentation today, how we are uh, going to embark on making sure we are truly collaborative, because that essentially is the DNA for Greater Manchester. Whatever we've ever done and whatever we ever do is always ensuring that we are as collaborative as we can. Um, you know, I'm a business owner myself, having been in business in my entire career, and, how, and I will be myself. Um, you know, making sure that my businesses are also uh, involved in, in, in taking these young people into our organizations and creating new opportunities for them. And so therefore I speak not only as the co-chair of Greater Manchester Lab, but, but, but a businessman who wants to make sure that we as a business uh, can see benefit uh, from this significant investment that the government has made and a welcome investment uh, in this, we've all lobbied for this, and to, just to say that Greater Manchester, from the outset, when COVID uh, hit us, 
uh, had very quickly mobilized in, in, in campaigning and lobbying uh, for a program such as Kickstart. So it's really welcome and you know we congratulate DWP and government for you know putting this in play in such a quick time. The key thing for us that it, it that this investment make you know lands and makes a difference and has the sort of success outcomes that we all aspire to, which is essentially new jobs, new opportunities for young people, particularly for us in Greater Manchester, and that businesses and employers can see their way to creating those opportunities and making them more permanent. You know, we are all in a flux at this moment in time, and maybe many of us, myself included, thought probably a month ago that we were into that bounce uh, that we'd all craved and, you know, we all, you know, sought. It looks like we're not going to be in the bounce as, as, as we envisaged, and maybe we're in more of a, uh, a decline still or a flatlining for a, at least another six months or, or beyond. So as business people and as employers, we know we're in a completely uncertain situation and in an unprecedented way. And, you know, our, our hopes and ambitions have maybe somewhat been um, further impacted over the last few days. But nevertheless, Kickstart and what it stands for is an opportunity for us to try and drive through the challenge of, of COVID through the, the, the struggles that we have in terms of retaining our staff and trying to keep our businesses moving forward. But it's an opportunity for us to create new opportunities and new jobs for young people, for those young people that we know have been impacted, are going to continue to be impacted uh, through this COVID recession. And for us to give that opportunity and, and develop an opportunity that can work for us and work for those young people. So in doing so, we've got to set our intention right from the outset. And, and today is the start of that intention that we want to make sure this works to the best possible outcomes. It will work. No doubt it will work. But what Greater Manchester and the family and GMCA and GM Lep and everybody is involved, the, the ESAP board, as, as Matthew said, we want it to work to the most best possible outcome, not just work not just do the job that government aspires, but to do it even better so that we can make sure that every single ounce of opportunity that was available to us was exploited and explored and the outcomes will be significant. And the outcomes will be that our ambition to create 16,000 plus placements, and I say placements, what I should say is jobs, and that's our aspiration. We want to create those, turn those placements into jobs and therefore, it's so important that our businesses and our employers from the outset can understand how we can make that happen and how we can support. And as a business person, what I'm seeking to see is the support that will be given to us, small and large businesses alike, to ensure that we have the best possible opportunity to turn these placements, one, to actually offer a placement, and secondly, to convert that placement into a more permanent job, new skills, new opportunities in our localities. And that's the other thing that we want to, you know, look to try and do that young people in our ten, across our 10 districts and across our locales have the opportunity to now seek and, and enjoy, you know, job uh, uh, experience and a placement and a, 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 a permanent job in the local, in their local communities, with their local businesses. And as much as possible, we want to ensure that we are deliberately doing that and supporting that. So there's a lot to do, but our intention is great. And today is the kickoff of saying in Greater Manchester and, and, and for DWP and for government, we want us to be the exemplar of how Kickstart and this investment can be made to work in such a profound way for businesses, for our employers, and for our communities. And we have a number of ideas that we want to share with you today as to how we can make that possible. But there are three overarching themes that we want to make sure we get right from the outset. One is clarity, clarity of information, understanding, so every business understands how this will work, how they can engage, and how they can actually benefit. 
every young person can see where that future could be and the pathways to those opportunities. For the gateway organizations to understand how they should be operating and we want to make sure that that communication is strong and we have got to do quality and the outcomes that are going to be realized have to be of that quality we can't just be in a tick box exercise that yes we've gone the numbers the quality and the quality of outcome has to be paramount the experience that young person gets that if it's a bad experience that will close them off to the future employment possibilities forever. Sorry, I just got muted. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yes, can now. Yes. Um, so we've got to ensure quality uh, comes about. And the final thing is that we are consistent, that we are not you know, sporadically brilliant, and then the rest of it's average. That across Greater Manchester, the consistency of support, facilitation, experience, and the business engagement is equally brilliant, whether you're in Rochdale or in Stockport or in Thameside or the city centre. And we, as GM, want to ensure that that is possible throughout, whether you're a small business or a large business, your experience of the Kickstart program will be equally brilliant. So that's a huge intention, but we want to set that intention right from the outset. And all of you have a significant part to play in this. And as we collaborate and as we will create this collaboration and make it work, we will ensure that Kickstart works for us, works for young people, works for businesses and works for our region going forward and building back better through COVID into more positive times. So a thank you to everybody once again. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's inspiring to see all of you here and inspiring to see how committed you are to making this work. So a big thank you on behalf of Greater Manchester Lab and on behalf of GMCA uh, for your participation today. Back to you, Matthew. Mo, thank you and thanks for for such an inspirational opening to uh, to today's session and it's fantastic to see the voice of the voice of business so firmly behind uh, kickstart and making it a quality experience for for both young people and and, and businesses uh, fantastic uh, i'm going to hand, hand over to, to Geraint now just to give the, the, the national perspective in terms of kickstart what it is some of the mechanics of the of the program and um, which you know everybody's really interested to um, to learn about as this is evolving on a on, on a on a kind of um, on a continual basis so so Geraint um, over to you morning matt morning mo and morning colleagues in greater manchester um thank you first and foremost for allowing me to join this morning's webinar um it really is a great opportunity to speak to, I think, over 150 um, like-minded colleagues from across the, you know, the city of Manchester and its wider area, um, looking to come together to support young people to, to make a real difference during what is difficult times by way of the, the pandemic crisis. Um, so I'm Garant Williams. I'm, the, um, I'm part of the, the DWP Kickstart policy team. My background, actually, is I... I head up universal credit delivery in South and East Wales, and I've been taken offline for a couple of months now, helping to operationalize the service, both in terms of the way that we engage employers and the way that we deliver our service from a job center plus and work coach perspective. So just to give you a couple of minutes this morning, and I'm sure there'll be you know, more value in the, the Q&A session later today, I thought what I would do is cover a couple of things in terms of the high level intent of the scheme, and then get into a little bit of detail in terms of the role of the gateway organization and the role of work coaches across the, the job center network. So just first and foremost, in terms of kickstart and why it's important, you know, we know that you know, young people are disproportionately impacted during the time of a recession. And I'm not quite sure that any of us have seen a recession like the one that we're currently encountering, either in terms of its depth or in terms of its complexity, in terms of the way that we have to to think differently about the way that we deliver our services. And, and therefore, as part of the, the plan for jobs announcements in early July, and then the kickstart launch in early September, you know, the intention from government is to, to look to engage all parts of society. So working with you know, big organizations, um, small organizations, organizations from the public, the private, the voluntary and charitable sectors, 
coming together to create high quality work experience placements for young people. Those people in, in the first instance on universal credit, aged between 16 and 24. Those young people who are ready for work. So not those young people who are still in need of pre-employment support, but those young people who are ready for work who are not yet competing successfully in the current labour market. So what we'll see within that is a range of young people. Some young people who are still trying to obtain their first place of work. Some young people who have been displaced by you know, the current crisis, you know, the, the furlough issues that we've seen of late, and may well be displaced through the autumn. Some young people who have you know, recently graduated from university, it's probably the the worst year on record to graduate from university, either in terms of securing that first work or in the ability to travel around the world, if that's what people are going to plan to do. And likewise, for those school leavers that had no ambition to enter the work, enter, enter university, but would prefer to enter the workplace. So we really need to, to come together to collaborate and to deliver as one on this. And DWP can't do this alone, and hence, you know, why we're doing things like today in terms of collaboration by way of seminar. And we are eternally grateful to colleagues across the um, the LEP and the combined authority space and others for the you know, the work in helping us to, to shape and design this scheme. And we are you know, really understanding of the fact that you know, it is immediate, it is tactical in nature. And if it was more long term or and more strategic, potentially we would want to to have done things slightly differently. And apologies if that is frustrated in any way. But that's not to say, again, that you know, this thing is perfect. It is far from perfect at this stage. You know, if we think about its predecessor in 2009 to 2011, uh, we've seen the Future Jobs Fund programme uh, operate over an 18-month window, you know, deliver about 105,000 outcomes of young people into work. But that scheme probably took the best part of about to develop. This scheme is the best part of weeks or so to get in place and as a reality it will be imperfect and will continue to be imperfect for some time and potentially there will still be lots of unanswered questions from today's session that we will I promise to take away and come back as quickly as we can as we start to evolve those you know, decisions and you know, sort of be able to socialize those responses that allow colleagues on this call and beyond to make more informed judgments and choices for the future too. So just wanted to alert you to the fact that you know, we are far from finished in its design. But in terms of what this is about in its simpler sense is that we want to help young people to enter the workplace. We probably want to do that nationwide in excess of 250,000 places. The Chancellor set aside about two billion pounds worth of investment for the scheme. I think our ambition is to hit between 250 and 300,000 quality placements for young people. Placements that will start in early November, probably the first Monday in November, and final placements starting in December of 2021, with you know, those people who then complete that programme for 26 weeks leaving in the summer of June of July of 2022. I think it's fair to say our ambition is that you know, we want to ensure that young people you know, not only have work and benefit from work financially, but more importantly, benefit from the experience of work through the, you know, the immersement in, in new environments, through the collaboration in partnership, the development of new relationships, and then the the development of new skills that provide the opportunity to enhance their CV and to amplify their ability to talk about their skill set in a more unsustained and supported labour market as we start to see the economy recover. So the importance of the placements is that we should see these as jobs, as Mo has just said. They are jobs. They are real jobs you know, for 26 weeks at 25 hours per week, paid at the relevant national minimum wage rate for that young person. We are appreciative of the fact that young people may well change age during participation. So what we'll be doing is paying at the, the age rate that we project that person will be at at the end of their provision type. So if we have young people aged 24 starting a job and we think that they'll be 25 within that six months window, we would pay the adult rate for national minimum wage, ensuring that we don't have to, you know, um, have complex calculations in place over that six months about days and weeks of 24 and days and weeks of 25 for example the way that the scheme is funded um, 
for employers recruiting 30 or more and i say 30 because that's the the floor limit for for people bidding by themselves as an employer so in circumstances where employers can bring forward 30 or more jobs we are saying that you know, those jobs can you know, don't all have to start at the same time. You know, they can start through the lifetime of the program, with some starting you know this autumn and some starting next winter and anywhere in between. We are saying those jobs can be the same jobs on a recycled basis, you know, because we think that a a good quality, high quality experience, you're benefiting more than one person is a benefit to more than one person. And therefore, there's no reason why we can't have 10 jobs that are recycled three times, for example, with jobs in November, jobs in May, June, and jobs in November. So an organization having 10 opportunities, but taking on 30 young people over that 18 month window. See, no issue with that whatsoever. What we are saying at this point is that potentially, um, for every job start that occurs, the employer will receive 1500 pounds so that £1,500 will be triggered on the, the job start. So paid in the, the early days of employment to cover the overheads of that employer in terms of the onboarding process, but predominantly to support the, the wraparound and employability and experience of that young person over the next 26 weeks. And we'll come on to that in a second in terms of how we would like to see that invested in. And then what we'll do is pay retrospectively in arrears at this point in time, I'll caveat it, uh, we'll pay retrospectively in arrears for salary, for on costs, and TPR pension costs. Quarterly in arrears at the end of month three paid in month four for the first three months. And at the end of month six paid in month second, month seven for the second three months. Now, we appreciate, I think, that there is the potential for some cash flow issues in that for small business and equally for bigger business taking on higher numbers of individuals. So there is a conversation ongoing at the moment to, to better understand whether or not we can move to a more frequent payment cycle. So what I think utopia is that we would pay retrospectively in arrears monthly. At minimum, I think we should be looking to, to push the quarterly to bi-monthly, paid in month two, month four, month six, for example. But I just wanted to put it out there at this point, the current design says quarterly in arrears, but we are working hard to see whether or not there, are, there is an alternative solution to that. So what we'll have is that £1,500 and salary and on costs in arrears from an employer perspective. And that relationship would be direct with DWP, with you know, jobs advertised in a job centre, hidden from public view, accessed by work coaches who manage caseloads of young people, who will then be you know, introduced and put forward to those jobs in the way that an employer would normally wish to recruit. And then the choice as to who the employer takes is the employer's choice. So there'll be no mandation to the scheme. There'll be no pressed individuals coming forward to jobs. Yes, we expect young people to avail themselves of opportunities for work, but we'll not be putting people forward in a kicking and screaming sense for these jobs. These will be young people who are able for work, who are eligible to work, who are suitable to work, are volunteering through conversation to compete for the jobs that that employer has. There is inevitably some consequence if young people fall out of work. Now, the department has a, um, a very well-developed care and compassion agenda now. So what we are looking to say within that space is that in some circumstances, the placement will fail. We'll do everything possible working collaboratively with the employer or the gateway organization and the citizen to make sure that those placements don't fail. But where they do, and where there's good reason to do so, we will just onboard that person back to benefit. And only in exceptional circumstances where there is a potential for misconduct, or somebody leaves voluntarily without good cause, would we look to, to question whether or not that person has put themselves into hardship and consider the potential for decision-making and appeals. But we anticipate that will be very few and far between because we would want a very strong collaborative relationship in terms of making sure that these things work. As far as the gateway organizations are concerned, we think these are pivotal to the success of the scheme. So we talked about the fact that we have a, a floor of 30 um, jobs for an employer, and yet we recognize the fact that not all employers will be able to offer 30 jobs. Now, the Chancellor was clear in his narrative from the outset that you know, what we want to do is to ensure that all business 
of all shapes and sizes can benefit from the scheme. And whilst this is about the young person in the first instance, the young person's effort in that workplace will inevitably want it help that business to grow from an economic perspective and help us to sustain, I guess, a, a stronger economy as we move forward. So we want that to be available to everybody, to people in the public sector, the private sector, the blue chip FTSE 100s, and the, the small businesses that exist across each of our communities. So in those organizations where an employer cannot provide 30 or more jobs, they need to engage with the scheme through a gateway organization. Now you may well have seen these heard out, uh, heard about the top two as a representative group, an umbrella body, an intermediary in recent time. But we have used the, the term gateway um, and we are fixed on that for the minute. So uh, if you hear me revert into old language, apologies. But a gateway organization is an organization, it can be anybody. Uh, we anticipate that you know, big combined authorities, that rep partners, local authorities, you know, big organizations from the private sector and others may well come forward to become a gateway organization. You might have seen at the end of last week that we published a list of those people who are interested um, on our gov.uk pages. That is not a finite list, but was a list of organizations who put themselves forward ahead of the, the deadline last Wednesday. You know, that gives us a starter for 10, I guess, in terms of introducing and attaching small business interest with gateway organizations across the UK. But it shouldn't be the finite list that we only turn to in terms of its potential. I'm really, really impressed and encouraged by you know, Mo's ambition for 16,000 jobs across Greater Man Manchester. That is absolutely brilliant in terms of its intent. And I think gateway organizations play a huge part in that. So what is a gateway? So a gateway organization in its simplest form is an organization who is bidding on behalf of other small employers unable to bring 30 jobs to the competition. So a gateway organization would collaborate with small business, would harvest that interest, would bring it together, would um, run the checks in terms of making sure that those jobs are new, that they are additional, that they are not you're replacing for no nutrition, that they are not like for like replacing for what we've seen by way of recent redundancy. They're not planned in by way of traditional growth within an organization, either seasonal or projected. Um, and then we develop together an application for, for the kickstart scheme. And the gateway organization then is the organization that has that direct relationship with DWP and acts as the conduit between those smaller organizations and DWP from a financing perspective. So we see that working in the form that the gateway organization will be paid and we'll, we will pay through the gateway organization for starts, the 1500 pounds that we've talked about and the salaries in arrears currently quarterly. And that money will be paid on by the gateway organization to those smaller employers on a trigger basis. For their trouble, the gateway organization will also receive a 300 pounds payment for every individual who enters the workplace. So that is 300 pounds per person, not 300 pounds per application. And I think there's been some ambiguity about that in recent time. So that will help to provide, I guess, the infrastructure and overhead for that gateway to operate. We did see under the Future Jobs Fund programme, and there's no reason as to why we couldn't replicate that this time around. A gateway organisation can also employ themselves. And we did see that in other programmes that young people who became a participant uh, acting on behalf of a gateway organisation facilitated the placement for other young people with other organisations. So please think very flexibly about how creation of new jobs can create the infrastructure that allows a gateway to thrive and to deliver the absolute value that we expect to, to receive through the Kickstart pro program. So in addition from a gateway perspective, um, the stuff to do with things like how do we assure for quality? How do we make sure that from an auditable perspective that things are being done well? Some of that detail is still yet to be designed and I'm really disappointed not to be able to share with you today details of the grant agreement and all of that black and white that we would need to see to allow us to make informed decisions. But we expect that to come in the coming days. We also expect for gateway organizations to potentially extend beyond that binary of being the bank and the conduit, because we know that gateway organizations have great insight to understanding of what needs are locally. 
And we also understand that lots of gateway organizations have you know, great experience in terms of delivering employability support. And what I guess we will see within that is in some circumstances, you know, that £1,500 you know, used to support the onboarding process and then the employability of that young person might well be used quite flexibly in a collaborative sense between the gateway and the employer to ensure that the gateway can help that employer to fulfil the actions required of them in ensuring that placement is a good placement. And there's nothing to stop that from occurring. We're not saying that the obligation is on the employer and the employer are going to make sure that placement is a good placement. You know, they can buy in services using that £1,500. We would not look to reconcile that the absolute spend has been spent on the young person, but we'll do that through the quality and the experience that we look to gauge in terms of our assessment of the service. And I'm sure that there'll be lots of ways that gateway organisations will look to collaborate with the employer community to make sure that young people benefit from the programme too. I'm linking that back to Mo's ambitions, I guess, as I, as I finish my part of today's presentation, and I hope it's been helpful. I do think that you know, the immediate shot in the arm that this provides is great for that young person. And it's great for the, the 16,000 or so young people that we you know, hope to help across Greater Manchester to enter work. But if all that does is allow for 16,000 young people to have six months at 25 hours at NMW rates, I think we will probably miss the point and the potential for the scheme itself. So that potential in collaboration, you know, that strength in delivery, that ability to allow us to migrate people before the end of their participation. In my personal opinion, and you know, this is not a, an opinion shared by the department yet, because we're yet to agree on the metrics in terms of success, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in the Q&A session. My view is, is that in some circumstances where the, the placement is not a sustainable job for the future, and we expect that to be in most circumstance, I think success is that the young person is leaving placement before the end of the 26th week because they have been successful elsewhere. And therefore, I think what we'll be looking to do together, you know, DWP, the gateway organisation, the employer and the young person is certainly wanting to, in addition to the experience over that 26 weeks, to think more formally from about month four onwards as to how does that young person start to, to lift their head and look at the horizon and think about where do they go next and how do they start to compete for that because of that strength and experience that they've just had. So Matt, Mo, I'll, apologies if I've overrun slightly, but I thought I'd just want to cover that in its entirety. I hope that's been helpful and I'll hand back to you now. Garen, thank you. That was incredibly, incredibly helpful. And I think that the, the point that you made that this is a, again, an agile, an agile build and things are being developed all the um all the time is a point is a point well made. And also the fact that the department is is listening to feedback. Uh, and it's taking that on board and we'll look to evolve that, evolve the programs that it that it genuinely delivers um, the, the aspirations that you all have for it. It was really, it was really good to good to hear. Um, I know the team are doing a fantastic job answering a number of the questions in the in the chat function, but please keep them, please keep them coming. And there's so much we'll pull out in the in the QA session. Um, but without further ado, I think I'll hand over to um to Elizabeth Taylor just to to give the the, the Ursa, Ursa perspective in terms of what quality um, should look like um, for a Kickstart programme. So, Elizabeth, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, I worked with, um, within the URSA membership community with um, some members who had previous experience of delivering work experience. Um, people who've worked on the old New Deal, community work placements, and, of course, Future Jobs Fund. Um, so, in the true spirit of collaboration, um, the group came up with our eight core messages and um, we produced these back in August. I think even now, sat here on the 25th of September, these are the eight things that, that we would stand by. I think we might add a ninth that's about cash flow and keeping money coming in so no organisations are excluded, um, but that's one we can pick up elsewhere. So. What we were trying to do was uh, stimulate the conversation about what good looks like. Um, that starting with the job, the obvious obvious point, 
that this should not displace other jobs, that they should add value, that they should look at what the world's going to be like beyond the pandemic, that they can contribute to communities and to wider strategic government at a regional or local level. Um, and so something like the GM initiative really, really fits in with that, um, with that sort of regional approach to, to how jobs can be created. Um, one of the other things, and this is something that I think this wider group that's on the call today can keep considering, is that um, we should take steps to make sure that young people that are most in need are not excluded from Kickstart. And I think one of the, the things that we've got to really focus on is um, the DWP are looking for young people that are ready for work. And of course, that is the case because employers want to recruit young people that are ready for work. So I think as, as the wider Kickstart community, there's, um, there's work that we can do to make sure that young people are ready that nobody's disadvantaged and those that today may be furthest from the labour market can access um, employment support and training that means they can be ready for kickstart. Um, so lots of stuff, you know, those of us who were involved around Future Jobs Fund know the benefit of things that build community wealth and that have impacts on the environment, positive impacts. So one of the things we did within the, the URSA initial group, now the wider forum, was we've engaged with environmental organisations, with arts education, uh, arts organisations, um, working with partners in the housing sector, so that we can look at what strong um, partnerships can be delivered. Um, good employer support. Um, GM always seem to lead the way with, with really good um, initiatives. But I think the whole thing about bringing employers together, um, making sure that the intermediary can stimulate job creation and that beyond Kickstart, there are the jobs for the young people who have benefited from it. So it's always inevitable when you take somebody who's not been working and you put them into a, a work environment that your people will need support. Um, it's not just, um, I'm really on my next slide now, just prompt whoever's doing them, that'd be great. Um, really important to um, make sure that young people need support. Now, I've talked about that pre employment, pre kickstart support to make sure everybody's got the best opportunities. but I think the other thing is things can and do go wrong um, and it will not always be somebody's fault. It's just the inevitable. So it might be that the domestic personal situation of a young person changes or it might be the, the, the employer unexpectedly has to make redundancies. So having a kind of kickstart board, having the GM approach to this, is brilliant because we need to be able to pick up and make things right for young people if something goes wrong. Um, I think the whole uh, initiative to build a lot of jobs in a locality is really important because young people must have the choice and the only way that an initiative like Kickstart works is if young people have a choice, if it's what they want to do and if they want to buy into it. And if they want to do it and they've bought into it, then it's better for employers and it's better for the longer term outcomes. So um, we live in a world and we have pre-COVID when too many young people don't have work experience. The area of the Saturday job, et cetera, is really, really decreased and diminished. So um, we need to make sure young people are prepared, that they don't feel they're being sent to something. Um, and that we consider that much wider offer. So I know um, on the webinar this morning, we're going to look at what the wider offer is for young people. But I do just want to make a point that Kickstart sits alongside training and education. It sits alongside training ships and apprenticeships and internships. And it certainly should sit alongside 
permanent jobs. So um, we need to be really, really aware of the wider offer. Um, I think employers need to be supported to offer full-time jobs and conversation that I'm sure will take place about cash flow. Um, we need to um, make sure employers can afford to deliver kickstart. And then we also need to know that young people um, can sustain themselves on the kickstart wage because not every young person will be living at home with parental support. We will have that whole range of things and they will have issues around housing and childcare and, and just the cost of getting to work. Um, so really good proactive support that helps and prevents young people return to benefits for six months. And I think here, there's the really strong point of working with the wider employment support community. Um, getting some of the resource, whether it's for the wraparound support or whatever, to organisations that have that track record of getting people into work, who are proactive with employer engagement, who can see what happens um, beyond kickstart for, for each young person. So that's the sort of the end of my um, eight core messages. Um, and then finally, uh, I've got a slide, a couple of slides about the view on the gateway role. Um, so I think the whole thing about an initiative like this one in GM is really good because it connects local businesses to kickstart. And it means that that good range and that um, variation of local jobs can be there and can be really important, can be really um, fruitful. And that young people will get the right job. And if young people get the right job, that means employers get the right employee for that six months. So that's a win win situation. Um, I think it's really important that when we look at the job roles, we need that really good mix of things that will lead to long term employment. But equally, if they're providing the work experience to make sure they're providing quality transferable skills, that if it's a, a project that's going to have several people doing the same role over the kickstart um, duration, that from a very early point, that young person knows that this is about upskilling for what they do next. And again, that's when um, the employment support community can play, another, play a part again in building up this quality transferable skills so they move on to something else. Obviously, new jobs and no displacement. And I'd like to think there's nobody considering Kickstart who's thinking they're going to lay off a zero hours employee to do this. But it's really important that we're clear about that and we spell it out. Um, and I, I come back again to making sure that young people have a choice. Um, they have a choice from the range of things that they are on offer through the youth employment offers, but also that they have a choice about which kickstart job they go for. And that makes the job of the work coach in the job centres really vital. But it also means that the gateway can provide that range of jobs to the work coaches and it enhances the whole situation. So we need to assist employers so this isn't a daunting task. We're making a lot of demands about what we think good looks like, what kickstart should be. Um, so the recruitment, the interview, the assessment process to make sure they get the right people, to have done some diagnostics so we understand the young person's support needs, and then to get them into that situation where Kickstart is employment with a six month contract, with the same terms and conditions of other employees, with good inductions, with a mentor on site, um, and working to company handbooks, risk assessments, so that this is real work and this prepares people for work in the future. Um, and then finally, just a few points about the wraparound support. It won't be enough to just place somebody, even with the best employer. Every young person will need tailored wraparound support. Um, they'll need work, pre-work preparation. Even young people who are identified as being work ready will need some encouragement and support before they go on. And then the importance of the induction, having their own action plan with smart targets that's regularly reviewed, with training, 
with employability and vocational skills built in from the beginning of the six months um, to know that the support mechanisms for when things go wrong so that nobody disappears off kickstart um, and to have preparation throughout the six months for a positive outcome and really so that young person can see a clear route um, through the wraparound support and I think it's really important that before any job starts it's, um, it's got to be really clear what will be provided by the employer by the gateway which earlier in the week I typed into Meadery um, and local support organisations make sure that we're making the best of the brilliant employment support organisations that there are in GM. Um, buy in wraparound support from them. Make sure um, that you've got employment support specialists on board who have strong employer engagement so that we get to positive outcomes. Um, I think that's the end of my, my um, points and I'm handing back to Matt. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Um, some really powerful, powerful messages, messages there, which, which I think all of us will, will, will fully, will fully en endorse in terms of both the, the key role that the gateway providers will, will, will play, will play in this, that key expectation around quality wraparound, wraparound support, uh, and that everybody who, who, who is involved in Kickstart leaves it with a with a positive positive experience, and and that's a really a really good segue, I suppose, into into why in Greater Manchester um, we want to build upon some of the 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 strong partnership structures that we have in place, in which you referenced uh, Elizabeth, uh, and to establish a, a GM Kickstart board. So, Katie, could you? Um, no, you've read my, you've read my mind. So you've 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 already moved on to the next next slide. So just uh, kind of building on some of the, the the points that Mo made at the at the very very beginning, we want to create sixteen thousand or perhaps you know up to twenty thousand quality new jobs in Greater Manchester through Kickstart, which fundamentally will transform the lives of young people and support business. However, um, I think what we all recognise is that. If Kickstart isn't a quality experience, it could leave deep, long-term scars. Um, and in Greater Manchester, uh, you know, many of us have a have a, a, a fond memories, and, and we're deeply involved in the in the Future Jobs Fund, which I think Greater Manchester was the single largest program program nationally was a real was a real success, and there's still some real expertise uh, across the city region that we're calling upon. Uh, to ensure that Kickstart builds on builds on the positive some of the positives from um, from, from that um, from that from that program, and we're we're establishing a, a GM Kickstart board to ensure uh, the greatest chance of success for of, for Kickstart in, in, in Greater Manchester. So we, we already have an employment and skills advisory panel in place, which brings together uh, national local government agencies, private sector businesses, business groups. Uh, the BCSE sector, I think, are critical um, to, uh, in this program, and particularly in terms of some of the wraparound, wraparound support, representative bodies, work and skills, for us, and we're keen to kind of harness that expertise um, and use it uh, under under kind of Mo's Mo's kind of chairmanship of the from the um, to for a, to create a GM Kickstart board looking specifically at this at this program. And and I'll touch on some of the reasons as to as to why before I bring I bring bring Mo in in a, in a few minutes to give to give his perspective. But just to be, be clear, I think I think as most of the we lobbied really hard and really strong for the for for something like a job creation program as a response to uh, as a response to COVID and uh, for young people. Um, however, we also lobbied hard for a key role for um, combined authorities and local partners in in managing um, a kickstart. A kickstart program and i think you know we, we haven't got quite as much control as we would like but that doesn't mean we can't do everything in our, in our powers to make it to make it a success so although as, as the board won't have any kind of operational delivery we do want to ensure that there's some quality and, and robust stewardship of this program across across greater manchester um, and there are a few things that, that we're that we that we're that we're doing to make that to make that that happen, uh, and 
just what, what one thing which we'll, we'll, make, we'll probably touch on in a, in a Q and A session is one thing which we're really pushing hard to make this to make this a success and to make this board fit for purpose is around making sure that we've got access to the right information and intelligence to ensure we, we can provide an effective stewardship role. So we want to steward not only job creation, so we, you know, we do want Greater Manchester to, to create uh, the largest number of jobs, of jobs possible. Uh, but we also want to ensure that those jobs are being created and distributed fairly across Greater Manchester. And it's not just certain parts of the conurbation where we're seeing that job creation. And we also to want to ensure that that those jobs are going to a broad range of young people and not just a certain type of young people, be that age or background or ethnicity or, or, or whatever, that there's that, that kind of fair spatial cohort di distribution. We also want to understand you know, how many jobs are being created, where, by whom, are they quality? Are they being filled? And if not, why not? And um, who is filling them? Are people sticking in, the, in those jobs? Are they then progressing from those jobs into something else? And how will we ensure that people are getting the wraparound support that they that they need? And I think the board and everybody in Greater Manchester recognises that those things won't happen by magic. There needs to be some coordination. There needs to be some support. And we have established a board to try and provide some of that some of that coordination. And just in terms of some of its some of its some of its aims, this program is a key pillar of the Greater Manchester strategy and particularly our, our kind of work and skills plan and we genuinely believe if Kickstart is, is the success that we all want it to be we will see reducing unemployment amongst young people in Greater Manchester. We will see Kickstart genuinely helping to support the economic growth of the of the city region and recover from, um, from Covid and just as importantly we will start to see reducing inequalities. So we'll start to see the right young people being supported in the right types of opportunities. So um, the board, which will which we'll be meeting on a, on a, on a, regular, on a regular basis, uh, will be looking at, are those high quality placements being, being, being generated? And we want to ensure that what's going, what's going out to businesses, partners, Gate, gate, um, gateways and, and, and everybody involved in this is that promotion of consistency of experience, promoting quality standards for placements and good employment practices. And, and, and in Greater Manchester, you know, we, we're starting from a, from a really sound base in that, in that respect. We have a Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter, uh, which spells out clearly and concisely what we believe creates a good employer and a great and a good job in Greater Manchester. And as Mo was, was at pains to point out at the beginning, Kickstart is creating jobs. So we want those jobs to be as much of a quality as any other job that's being that's being created. So to ensure that there's, there's kind of security of work, flexibility is being built in. I think and, and a few a few of these questions have come up in the in the chat, you know, where, where possible, you know, what opportunities are there to pay real living, real living wage for this? What opportunities are there to increase the number of hours that, that are available? And how do we ensure that young people who are being supported uh, into these jobs and in work, um, their voice is being heard by the, by the employer and they're genuinely helping to shape that, uh, shape that, that business. The recruitment practices that, we're, that people will be following are fair, open, transparent and creating pathways for, for some of our more vulnerable young young people, and that there's quality people management um, whilst out, whilst on program, and people aren't left um, to their own devices and left to kind of uh, squander what could be a great a great opportunity. And what's so so important in the current climate is that we're not putting the health and well being of young people at risk through this. So the, 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 those are core tenets. Of, of the GM Good Employment Charter, and I'll post a, I'll post a link to it in the in the um, in, in the chat. And would I would advocate everybody to have a look at what of what we've already said is quality uh, uh, quality um, employment in Greater Manchester, because we shouldn't be expecting any less of Kickstart as we would for other for other jobs. So I think we've got a, a huge role to play around advocacy, 
uh, promoting uh, the right the right types of, of advice and guidance, the right types of what make people aware of what quality of uh, wraparound support is already available in Greater Manchester, and creating some of those uh, some of those some of those links, and and this is what's really pleased to hear Garant talk about that we'll be able to use that local insight and intelligence to continually improve the Kickstart programme. And I'm going to be parochial about this. I want Greater Manchester's Kickstart programme to be the best in the country and something which we would want to see continue and develop. And that this is seen as a part of a truly joined up work and skills system so that people are getting the right support uh, so making the right decision about whether Kickstart is the right right thing for them. They're clear about what support's available to them when they're on programme. And as importantly, they're clear about what opportunities there will be for them to progress from Kickstart, be that into an apprenticeship, be that into a job, be that into, into further education or higher education. And, and I'm really pleased that we've already seen a large number of you know, of real kind of quality local organisations coming together to say they'll they'll provide that that gateway that gateway role, and we will try and use that 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 board um, to steward that as much as as much as possible. But I want to kind of kind of finish uh, by handing over to to Mo just to to really kind of bring home the the business perspective from this. And for me, it's so important and it's so great that that Mo is chairing our 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 Kickstart board because this is. Um, has got to be driven by 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 business. So Mo, I'm going to hand over hand over to you. Well, thanks, Matthew. And you know, for a Friday, you know, this is the sort of passion we want to take us into the weekend. And and you know, thank you to Geraint and Elizabeth for you know for fantastic presentations. And hopefully, that sort of taken a step forward in terms of that clarity that we're talking about. But what I just want to say a few words about the re reason why we've put the board together and, and what the board will do is that from a business and employer point of view, we will probably fall into two camps as businesses and employers. Either Kickstart will be a bridge that we will provide for a young person to move to a more permanent destination and may not be with us, it may be with another employer because we don't have the capacity right now um, to, to commit to a, a permanent role beyond the placement, or we are a destination. But what we don't want to be happening is that that bridge leads to an OK corral, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of a, a frenzy of things, but nothing meaningful or no meaningful pathways or destinations. And we don't want the destination to become a revolving door where the employer sort of fails to see value, uh, the young person does not sort of, you know, transition properly, and it's a revolving door. The reason for this board's existence is to make sure that we can, you know, pick up on improvements and where it's not happening properly, we can try and address that, and work with DWP and other colleagues to try and ensure that no business, no employer should be in a position having been engaged in kickstart to say this did not work for us or this was a failed endeavor that is if one organization one company says that or has the core of the reason to be of that uh, opinion we failed so every employer and i saw in the chat where you know so, you know people have mentioned that you know how do we avoid duplication you know, young people have other choices as well. You know, we don't want a sort of a frenzy where 10 gateway organizations are, are, are landing on one company to try and offer them, you know, facilitation. Absolutely, we don't want that to happen. And we want coordination, clear pathways, clear processes and clarity of understanding so that businesses can feel confident to engage and not be sort of, you know, skeptical or, or 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 sort of you know not wishing to engage because they're worried that the minute they step into this, as we've seen maybe in previous situations, that they're just going to be inundated with people saying the same things in different you know ways, and we don't have the time to to work with this, and they will walk away from what could have been a, a great opportunity for those young people. We must and must ensure that their experience is one of success 
of one of motivation and inspiration and gives them the skills and the capabilities to turn that into a permanent career and a career that will contribute to the GM economy. So there's a lot of work to do and I've seen the chat and I've, seen, I've read some of the things. We will avoid duplication. We will avoid complexity where, where there is and we will ensure that that consistency, clarity and quality exists so that no business other than you know, in any context has the reason to say that kickstart did not work for us or did not work for me. We want to hear success and we want to make sure we can help you deliver success. And I, for one, will be testament to that because my own experience will hopefully play out with everybody else's as well. So this is our commitment. You've seen what we're embarking to do. We can't do it ourselves. We need all of you to work with a with that you know passion and commitment for Greater Manchester, for Greater Manchester to, to succeed, for its young people and its businesses to succeed, to create new jobs. We want a job rich recovery, not just the recovery, not coming out of COVID and say, yes, we've come through COVID and you know, but we want a job rich. What's the point if we come out of COVID with businesses coming back and GVA and GDP coming back? but we've got higher unemployment than when we started. That's not recovery. Recovery will be that we can recover and create jobs and have a job rich recovery. And particularly for those most disadvantaged, most vulnerable young people, we've given them a future that they can commit to. So, so, so it's bold intentions, like I say, but we will make this happen with you as part of the GM collaborative. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you, Mo. Um, and as you so succinctly put, this is going to be a huge, a huge success if we all work together and build on the quality partnerships that exist in Greater Manchester between business providers and government. So, so a real, a real, real kind of call to call to action from you, um, from you there. So, uh, we've got we've got, a, we've got some time for a for a panel a panel discussion now. Uh, which I'm going to try try my best to chair to chair virtually. Um, and I know that the team and particularly colleagues at, at Job Centre Plus have been working tirelessly throughout this throughout this session um, to answer the, the questions um, which have been which have been uh, which have been coming through thick and fast, which is really good and really positive to see such interest uh, and so and so many questions. I will I will try to um, to, to bring some of those some of those um, together. Um, and I think there'll be there'll be opportunities if people want to put their hand up as well. I'll try and bring some uh, some some people some people in. Um, and we've got some uh, kind of distinguished uh, guests again in terms of our, our our panel members. So great that Garrett could stay could stay with us to perhaps answer some of the more kind of technical and policy questions that that have been coming through thick and fast around um, around around Kickstart. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, from, from Ursa and then then Mo in terms of Greater Manchester lap perspective, and I might use chairs prerogative and and uh, and and put my my two pen in as in as in as well here and here and there. So I think I think I'll I'll start just by the fact by looking at some of the some of the questions that have been that have been asked asked or asked all already, and I suppose that a number of a number of questions have been have been raised around eligibility um, for uh, for Kickstart and. You know, bit, bit more well, a bit more clarity in terms of exactly who is this who is this open for? And I don't know whether this is perhaps more, more directed at, at Garrington in the first in the first instance. Um, in terms of of younger people who may not be claiming universal credit, um, I think that there's reference in the chat that potentially things may change over time. I don't know whether you, whether you're able to share any more information just to, to clarify the, the 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 eligibility, but also. Um, if there's any sense of on what basis some of that eligibility may change over 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 time, sort of with the decision making process. So, 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 Garrett, I don't know whether you can you can help with with, with that one. Yes, Matt, I'll, I'll try my best. Um, so, el eligibility at the moment is, is very much a minimum viable product. Yeah, so we see eligibility at this stage as being young people aged between sixteen and twenty four. Uh, we do anticipate that the number of young people aged between 16 and 17 will be low in terms of those people claiming universal credit. But we are saying that young people who are on universal credit of that age would be entitled to join the scheme. So it's the eight year bracket of 16 to 24 
claimants of universal credit, currently classed as M unemployed, so no current earnings from an employment of any kind, um, and are at risk of the scarring effects of long-term unemployment. So if you were segmenting that out, you know, those people who are still in need of pre-employment support, we would see them as ineligible. Those people who are already competing um, favorably in the current labor market should be encouraged, encouraged to stay there and to do so, because that would be in an unsustained, unsupported way. For those people where a traineeship or an apprenticeship or other route is more appropriate, we would want for those people to stay in those routes too. But the middle ground of people who are of that age group are at risk of long-term unemployment because of the, the depressed opportunities currently available, who are ready for work, and where other opportunities are not appropriate, we see those as being the prime eligible target at this stage. As far as, you know, we do appreciate there are other young people. So, you know, our Secretary of State is certainly of the opinion that we need to, to consider how we open the scheme up to other young people in time. So in terms of those other young people, they would be and include other young people on other working age benefits. So that could be you know, job seekers allowance, new style, old style, combination of both, employment and support allowance, new style, right the way through to, to those young people who are, in essence, economically inactive, but not claiming benefit. Now, the issue with some of that stuff at the moment, right, is... You know, there is some complexity around the, the benefit picture and there is some complexity around the onboarding process for, for young people who are not in receipt of benefit. But we know that we need to bring that forward because it would feel perverse to encourage benef benefit changing and it would be feel perverse to encourage benefit claiming for those people that are not currently claiming benefit purely to become entitled to join the Kickstart programme. So we are working through at this point how we create that front door. We don't anticipate that that will come this autumn. Uh, we are hopeful there'll be something there from the early part of the new year. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. So, so much. A really, really helpful answer. And and I I assume that the things like the that the kickstart board, which we've um, which we we're, we're, we're establishing in, in Greater Manchester. Um, Obviously, we'll have a, a wide range of organisations there who've got links into communities. We'll have some probably some some rich information in terms of the types of young people that could benefit from this type of support. That's information that I presume will be that DWP will be interested in, in seeing. So there's opportunity for us to kind of feed that to feed that in. Yeah, I, I think this is yeah, this is absolutely about collaboration. You know, Mo talked about this being a, a greater Manchester effort, and and this is absolutely true. I think. You know, the more that we can continue a conversation, you know, the more that we can collaborate across the work coach communities with you know, those people in society having as regular interaction with young people, advocating the fact that the scheme exists. You know, maybe stopping short of the absolute promotion to the point of where you know, this person is suitable and eligible for this job that we know is available. Because you know, what we are saying at this point, at least, is that the work coach in the job centre will hold the pen on understanding eligibility and making a referral to, to a to a an available placement at the point of where that becomes a challenge piece because a work coach gets a nod from an employer who you know knows a young person who you know, needs a referral to be able to pull down the money it starts to erode doesn't it that potential for autonomy and responsibility from a work coach perspective so i think it, it is about you know tight conversations it is about strong collaboration and i think where those relationships are right and you know my feel certainly you know, doing this job in cardiff for example cardiff newport and the valleys and i'm sure people like you know you know pete jameson and others across the you know the greater manchester and merseyside area and beyond too you know have really strong links into this community so i'm sure the you know the links are really tight the, the more that we have that conversation and collaboration on the ground, the less likely we are to feel pressed within that space and the more likely we are to deliver good outcomes for the young person at the heart of this. Thanks, Gary. And just before I, I see with both uh, Greg Bate and um, Payne Zara, Payne have, have, have their hands up. But just before before, before I bring them, bring them in, I think the, 
and kind of there's been a theme, I suppose, throughout throughout some of the some of the questions, which I think follows on from what you just said, Geraint, just about the the key the key role of the work coach in this in this process. So there are a number of questions being asked around how to advertise, how to advertise vacancies, and how, in effect, young people uh, will be will be linked to, with with with, it, with employers. And I think from, from from my understanding that the the work coach has just got an an, an integral part to play in in that in that process. Um, are you able just to expand a little bit more in terms of how that how that process will work and the and the role of the work coach within it? And then I'll, then I'll then I'll uh, I'll bring in the questions from the floor. Yeah, no problem at all. So we, so you know, just in terms of you know we we don't. I think there's absolute value in making sure that you know we sell the brand of Kickstart right. You know, either from a a partnership delivery perspective and or a recruiting employer perspective. Yeah. You know, the risk is is the financial one, right? That links back to us being able to determine you know, suitability, eligibility, and then to be able to manage the the true added value of a scheme. Yeah. So employers that become part of the scheme, gateways, and employers that become part of the scheme, we will be providing a a suite of of products that will allow those employers and gateway organisations to to brand themselves as you know collaborating in delivery on some of this stuff. And we'd want that to be, you know, promoted far and wide because we want this thing to to gain momentum and to drive new interest. Because it, it will be a challenge to get the numbers that we're wanting to talk about here. There's also an opportunity within that to say that an employer is proud of being part of the Kickstart scheme and to advertise the fact that they are, you know, and have jobs available, you know, but they should look to sign posts for those jobs back into DWP. Who will then sort of you know, talk to those young people and those potential for candidates about how we match those to jobs? So you know, promotion and publicity is an absolutely right thing to do. What we're seeing at this point, right? And again, this is you know, still part of the early design of the scheme, is that your know, work coaches have caseloads of universal credit customers. You know, predominantly those ones within the intensive support group are the ones who are most likely to be suitable and eligible for the scheme. And we're having you know, more frequent conversations than ever with those young people. Uh, and that's now expanding across our wider youth offer, which I'm sure you'll be aware of, you know, the youth hubs and the other collaboration spaces that exist. So what we're saying is, based on the eligibility question I've just answered, that a work coach will understand that, will understand the needs of that young person, will be in regular conversation with them, and will have sight of the vacancies that have been advertised through successful bidders. Now, the way that will work is when the bid is being deemed successful, we'll be gathering information about the vacancy and a team in the central structure will then be populating a, a jobs board in essence. So that jobs board is hidden from public view. It is only available to the work coach within the Universal Credit Build. And it will allow the opportunity for that work coach to pivot out by way of a geographical radius from the postcode of where that young person lives and into a sector specific preference as far as what that young person is looking to achieve. And that will allow us to create that potential for match. And then that will you know, sort of trigger into a conversation between the work coach and the customer about, so this is available, you know, this is what they're looking for, we think you are a good match for this, are you up for it? This is how you apply. And by pressing a button, we will trigger intent to the employer that we are sending a young person but also then tell that young person through the same electronic means as to how they apply for the job. Now, how they apply for the job will be the way that an employer traditionally recruits. So that could be from as simple as pick up the phone and ring Matt or Mo to you know, send an email to this address, complete an application form, go online or do a variety of things. The key thing within that is the checks and balances bit, right? Is that the reconcilable bit around how we make sure that we pay for the right people in participation and we reduce the potential for risk of employers recruiting people who are ineligible is that we'll be cross-referencing the referrals made by a work coach and they'll be throttled in number to a number that's agreed with the employer that they are willing to accept by way of interest, traditionally between about five and eight applicants for every job that exists. And at the point of where, you know, those five or eight then you know, deem somebody successful in competition, 
well, that's where we would go. If there was a need to open that out further, we would continue to do so in the way that normal vacancies are filled. And at the point of where that young person starts or is starting, we will be cross-referencing the referral with the, the young person and ensuring that that referral is then, in essence, is the thing that is, is triggering the potential for payment. If a young person starts who hasn't been referred, the, the risk in this is that the employer will not have the eligible payment costs. And that becomes the problem, I think. And that's why what we're saying at this point is the work coach is at the heart of this in terms of deeming eligibility and suitability. Thanks for that, um, Geraint. And so is that, that kind of critical, just a, a critical piece of the of the of the jigsaw in, to make this whole process work, which again, which is why some of those those local partnerships and things like a GM a GM book could just be so so important and powerful to ensure that uh, that work coaches are making the best possible possible decision. So I'm going to um, uh, to take a couple of questions from the from the from the floor, and then try and try and bring in a few others which are, which are, which have come through. So, um, I'll bring Greg Bait in first. Could you just in introduce yourself, um, Greg, and then before you ask and uh, before you ask your question? Yeah, absolutely. Afternoon. I trust that you can hear me. So, uh, Greg Bait uh, from CTEP Plus. Uh, firstly, before the question, just want to say thank you to the panel. Um, inspirational to hear the energy and enthusiasm and, and passion that they've got behind the Kickstart program. So absolutely fantastic. Um, my question comes on behalf of BW3. So I'm a, a trustee for a charity called BW3. Uh, and we're a charity that's made up of 225 employers as membership organisations. So it was a very quick question for Garen with regards to you mentioned earlier that for an employer, all 30 jobs don't have to start at the same time. Would the same apply as if you were a, a, acting as a gateway organization? Absolutely, Greg. Yes. Yeah. So um, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, and, and 30 is just a, you know, a floor figure. And the reason we've gone for 30 is that at the point of where we, we drove it to less than that, right? You know, one, um, potentially, it doesn't become as financially viable or interesting from a gateway organisation perspective. And two, at the point of where we drive it beneath that, potentially what we end up with is we are inundated with very small individual relationships for you know, handfuls of jobs and beneath. So, so yeah, in terms of this, from a gateway perspective, we then would include the you know, the third and charity and vol voluntary sector Um the, the, the sequencing for starts it will be over that 14 months worth of you know, potential for delivery from November to the end of December 21. So any time within that period. Fantastic. So, for example, we've got employers now that, that want, obviously, um, job starts in November. We've got some that do want to take part in the scheme, but given the current restrictions and everything that's going on, probably can't commit to starting someone in January and February. But as long as those 30 placements happen, uh, 30 jobs happen sometime during the, the, the programme, that's fine. It is. So, so you'd have to you'd have to declare them as part of the bid. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, and, and articulate the, the potential for them. Um, but the fact that they come forward in, in the new year is, is not an issue. You know, you know, the, other, the other side of that, Greg, actually, right, is that you know, what we're saying there is that you know, 30 is the floor, right? You know, but 30 is not necessarily you know, where it should stop, right? Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you know, we're also saying that there is nothing wrong with you know, uh, an organisation, an employer or a gateway, you're know, bidding on a multiple of occasions, Right, because I wouldn't want to leave it so late that you know GM, you know GM sort of I don't know pull together a bid for ten thousand, for example, right? That takes a while to occur, that then misses the potential for opportunity for November jobs. Yeah, so so if, if we get to the point of thirty quickly or whatever that optimum number feels like for the organisation, um, then they can bid, and they also then have the ability to bid again. So if new business came forward. If growth changes, circumstances change, we can flex and evolve that through subsequent bids and amendment to the existing two. Excellent. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. That's great. Thanks, Greg. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Uh, before before I bring in, I know that there are a few more hands being raised, which which is which is fantastic. I just wanted to kind of pick up one of the questions, which was in the uh, well, a, a, a theme, I suppose, of questions in in the in the chat, just around um, business business engagement. Um, 
and how we we kind of coordinate that or, or, or reduce the risk of the risk of, of, of duplication and and um, as was just a, a point I, th I think already for the northwest there are probably in the region of 200 organizations have 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 put their names forward to dwp as providing that gateway that gateway role um as I said you know for greater manchester's perspective we've got no uh, we've got no direct control over the Kickstart program, but there's a key key role for us in terms of in terms of messaging for for businesses. So, so Mo, I didn't know whether you, whether you wanted to to kind of respond to um, to some of that, just into how you best think that uh, the board could could it could best ensure kind of consistency of message, if nothing else, for for businesses and 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 reduce the risk of of duplication. Do you have any any, any views on that? I, th I think, look, we, we, we clearly are in a situation where this will evolve and good practice will come forward, which we need to share and disseminate. I think it is all, you know, where this will work is, you know, across GM, within our sub-regions, where we have, you know, our local authorities, our DWP operations, those gateway organisations that are founded from those uh, environments as well. So we know that there's housing associations and other business organization groups and, you know, Greg mentioned just now his organization who have a particular understanding of that local landscape and how we then ensure that the business community there or the employer community are not in, in effect, you know, having this constant, you know, knock on the door and people sort of saying the same things, offering up uh, the kickstart opportunity. So I think it will come down to self-governance within that and we as a board will try and ensure that where that is not working we try and see ways in trying to improve that but ensuring that there is a, a respect to this situation and it's so important that this does not become a feeding frenzy of you know numbers of companies and we want to get 30 so we'll just go off and you know offer something and it's a sales activity it's got to be done with that intention the true intention that we want to ensure those businesses that are going to come forward we are in the best position to support them but again make sure that they're not being bombarded uh, and that will just come through time i think we just have to learn how this will land and then where there is issues, we try and address them and communicate that across. But it will come down to gateway organizations. And this is why the board is important, that we want people and gateway organizations signed up to a code of conduct, really. In GM, we, we need them. We've got the good employer charter. That's a code of conduct that we must respect the processes that we must follow. We can't just unilaterally behave in a way that will you know, impact badly. And, and actually have a negative effect on the outcome. We have to and have to ensure that this is GM and GM aspires to a standard of, of conduct and we must ensure that that is uh, communicated to all gateway organizations seeking to operate in the GM conurbation and the board will ensure that we, we get that communication out there. Great, thanks, Mel. And that, that point you made around kind of clarity and consistency of, of messages where the board can really play play a key role so that businesses know what's out there, what support's available, and hopefully through our, our joint working with Job Centre Plus on, on the ground, we'll have a better sense of where things are working well and where things aren't working quite so well and where we might need to take some take some some collective action. And um, can I bring I think Grace Challoner was um was next with the with a hand up. So Grace could you could you introduce yourself first please? Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm Grace um, and I work for the National Enterprise Challenge um, and we're really keen to become a gateway. Um, and this kind of follows on from Greg's question earlier. I just wanted to check with you. Um, obviously, we needed to get 30 positions before we could uh, send them through to the government. And I just wanted to double check, if we wanted to then put more roles forward after that, would we have to reach 30 every single time or could we then drip feed five, six roles through at a time after that? Yeah, good question. Um, Garant, so so if, if you start off with 30, but then only have kind of three or four after that. So once you've hit that 30, are you then able just to continue to add add to that? Great question, Grace. And it, it's being worked through at this point in time. You know, we, we definitely know that we are you know, going to work to a, 
um, a 10 to potentially 20 percent flex on the on, on the bid agreements that are in place you know that's going to come out by way of the you know the narrative on the grant agreement shortly so a, a 10 percent to 20 percent would give us a three to six uplift wouldn't it on 30 for example yeah. right um i need to get that absolutely clarified because obviously that's tied up in the you know, the finance and commercials aspects of things but certainly we were wanting to do that because we'll probably see numbers go in the opposite direction to what we when you know, things start to drop away from in early intent perhaps um, as far as in addition to that number as i understand it it will then require for, for us to hit the next ceiling you know, the floor limit of 30 again but let me come back to you on that one grace i'll, I'll write back to, to matt and mo and hopefully have some of that circulated if that's okay that's great thank you so much um, before I'll, I'll bring in uh, Nikki Maker ne next for the question, but before I just wanted um, as a, a question for for uh, Elizabeth, uh, building building on Mo, Mo's point around around self self governance. So many gateway organ organisations may well be URSA URSA members. So I'm just wondering what what, what role do you see <coughs> URSA playing in ensuring that that the market does govern itself as as best as possible? Um, well, obviously, we're, as a membership organisation, we can't. Um, control the way our members behave but what we've tried to do is establish well we've established a kickstart forum um we've had one huge meeting and we've got another one on tuesday um, and within that we're trying to stimulate partnership working and collaboration about good practice building on those key core messages um making sure that people within the employment support sector behave you know behave well and, and share um i think that's the best we can do it's a kind of that bringing the collective together with some responsibility but we certainly don't police the sector and we don't see that as our role but i think really um the dwp have a role in that really don't they when they approve intermediaries and they consider the wraparound support so not an adequate answer but i think we just have to do it as a a community of of good providers yeah thanks thanks for that um nikki uh nikki makler i think is could you just you got your hand up so if you want to ask your question introduce yourself yeah hi i'm nikki meikle um i work for bolton at homes for one of the housing associations housing associations and um, we are really excited about that um, again just echoing for the panel today it's been it's been really Good listening to you, how enthusiastic you are and what you want to bring to it. Um, we're so excited. So my question is around, we already work on the skills support for employment programme. Um, so we're in a room, so my role is on the work experience side of it. We're going to be looking at the, the kickstart. We are looking at that. Um, we've already got 15 um, job descriptions written, ready to go. It's around employment side of our partners. We've got internal jobs that we, we can advertise, and we've also got jobs with our partners. Now, we're not acting as an intermediary. Um, we are joining forces with the other housing associations across GM. Um, one Manchester are putting in the bid. So we're not the intermediary. Um, and what our question is around the kind of employment law um, could we employ them directly with Bolton at home and then put another organization or would they need to employ them directly and put them on their own payroll because we, we are looking to have put a request in that we pay that actual real living wage and top up what the government is paying um, that's looking highly likely that something we can do um, but then I'd need to start again with negotiation across our partners to see if we can we can do that with them and set up the table and things like the evaluations for the job um, and where it kind of sits. So my question is, can we employ them directly? We're not an intermediary, or do we need to be both in? Thanks, I think your, your, your connection was coming out a little in and out a little bit, so I'm not sure I, I, I grabbed it fully. So, is your question? So, you've got um, a number of jobs within your within your organisation, but you also want to <coughs> offer opportunities to other 
potential other employers. Yes. And and was the question about whether or not you could be the host employer for them or not? Or uh, did I? I'm not sure whether I heard that correctly. We have a really good relationship with our employers, with our partners. Um, we already offer the wraparound support, the work experience. So this is kind of an add-on to that. Um, and it's great the fact that we can pay these young people. We can have them for six months and we, we can really do some good work with them, develop them. Um, what, I don't, what I don't want to happen is to put, put people off by saying um, it, it needs to go through your own company through the payroll role because we've already got that really good relationship. So can we employ them directly or would they need to provide by the company? Okay, no, I think I think you understand. So that's a, that's a good a good question. So in effect, can can an an intermediary uh, or a gateway um, employ employ a person a kickstart or in fact create a kickstart job and then in effect um, acting as the employer on behalf of another org on behalf of another organisation, which which is something which we which we saw a lot we saw on future jobs fund so i don't know Geraint, whether that's something that's in the in the current rules or or not in terms of in terms of in effect providing almost running an agency role yeah i was going to say it feels like acting like an agency matt doesn't it right um and yeah the the honest answer is that is that it's not been evolved yet as a a potential response right um yeah, I, I absolutely get Nikki. You know the the type of thing we are suggesting there. I, I I think it will be something that we would you know, want to encourage to happen, right? And we all need to look to to take away and to evolve a response to, right? Um, there are a couple of bits to it for me because it's not the first time that this question has been asked in probably consecutive days this week, right? Um, and it's the bit about there are two elements to this, right? It's the is there an erosion to the role of a gateway where the gateway is acting as the employer in terms of the 300 pounds? Yeah, because you know, there's an element to that, isn't there? Because you know, how do you differentiate? At the moment, we've got something very binary, which is this is an employer, this is an intermediary. The employer gets 1500 pounds, which includes some overheads for onboarding. This is a gateway who gets three hundred pounds to deal with the overheads and the fifteen hundred pounds, but yet what we're talking about here is something which is more hybrid that sort of covers both of those things. So I think we need to understand that from a granting perspective first of all to to work what that feels and looks like in terms of the the three hundred pounds bit. The secondary bit for me, right, is then to do with the experience of the young person. Um, so the experience of the young person in terms of understanding, I guess is to who are they employed by, right? You know, because this is employment, isn't it, right? How does that feel and look in terms of the way that they you know, transfer that in terms of their experience, in terms of their future potential for competition? Who becomes liable by way of the employment aspects of things, right? Um, and where does all of that stuff fit in terms of the potential for complexity, coupled with the fact as to how unsettling that might feel or not feel in some circumstances for the young person who's the heart of it. So I think all of that stuff is not insurmountable. I think all of that stuff just needs working through for it to work well. Uh, and let me take that away, Nikki, and I'll come back to you if that's okay. Yeah, can can I just clarify that we 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 are not an intermediary. We are we've, we've put a joint. We've, we've basically put a joint in the file, so we won't be acting as the intermediary. But what what we are really good at is we provide the wraparound support, um, and the employer will do the day to day managing of the person. But we're still heavily involved with that that young person delivering the training. Um, and moving them on to the next step, full-time employment. So can I just check then, obviously you, you talked about the payroll bit of it, right? So obviously you know, there's an element for me, and I, and I do get that this might be, you know, there, there'll be localised solutions to things. So in, in the, you know, the £1,500, for example, right? If, if that was used by the employers that you're networking with to, to call off the services that you're delivering by way of employability support, yeah, to pay for that infrastructure to occur. But the employer was then still the, the host employer for the purpose of you know, paying rations and direct experience of work. 
you know, but they then use the fifteen hundred pounds to to commission services from you in terms of the wraparound stuff. That I think feels absolutely fine. The bit where, to some degree, you know, the training organisation employs the people, but then sublets those individuals to to employers to gain the work experience, but holds the pen on the training experience bit of it. I think that's the bit that probably needs work. I, I, I think it's I think it's doable. I just think that we haven't catered for it yet in terms of guidance. And it would be interesting to see how you would you know, articulate that in you know, the application form that it became sufficiently clear for the, the panel assessment team to make sure that they understood that. But let me take it away. Um, Nikki, I can see your surname, um, but obviously I'll again come back through Matt if that's okay with your response. Garen, that, that, that's really that's really helpful, yeah. thanks. And I'm sure there'll be there'll be a number of questions which we which we don't get round to answering all of them all of them today, but we'll take we'll take them away. And and there may well be opportunities to to to, in effect, to generate locally some practical examples to, to illustrate some of the some of the some of the questions of how might um can a, an agency approach work to, to then to then I suppose uh, give something with, give something a bit more su uh, substance for the department to, to have a look at. I give an example, Matt, right? Because it's a it's a live example at the moment of a, a an organisation that I'm working with, right? So I'm working with an organisation, you know, some test and learn stuff, right? Um, they're a a tech training organisation, right? Who have you know very strong relationships with you know, the big multinationals you'd expect to see in that space, right? You know, people that you, know, you switch your TV on and see in terms of the the packages that you buy. Right, your Netflix, your Amazon, your Googles, your others. Right um, now, you know, they are saying that they have got you know real traction in terms of engaging those organisations. Right, uh, but what they want to do is to you know, offer in a very similar way to Nikki, I think, um, over that six months worth of placement, um, twenty eight days worth of the employability support, four weeks. Right, um, and they're going to do that in a very vibrant way. Right, um, doing stuff online with you know uh, real senior and significant partners in Netflix and others, right? In in something that I think is just not replicatable in terms of what we've got currently available to young people in society, right? So, so what we're going to do with that is, in essence, that will mean won't it that the young person will be in work for five months, right, and in employability support for one month in the six month program, and. I think that's permissible because what we've got within that space then is, you know, what we're saying in essence is that you know, a young person is going to do 28 days worth of employability support within a six month work experience placement. So therefore, while they're in work and whilst they're being paid, they will also be doing training work that is absolutely of value to them in the future. And that is going to be done by, you know, in this case, and very similar to Nikki, um, somebody who would then employ and sublet um, but they, they we're trying to work that one through, which is why I'm saying I just need to take it away and bring it back. But um, I think it's a great example that, and one we would want to encourage. Great, thanks for that, uh, Garrett. I'm going to try, try in, the, in the last few minutes, just try to go through the, 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 the final people who've got, got their hands up and then the questions which are in, in the chat, we will be taking them away and we're looking to, to respond to them. But can I bring in Nikki Burley? Hi, just to confuse you, it's actually Rob Burley here. Nikki oh, I had to leave. Um, so thanks very much again for today. It's been a really interesting panel discussion. Uh, Nikki and I run a, an HR consultancy based in Stockport and we've applied to be a gateway organisation. So my first question is, uh, clearly we'll work very uh, closely with the employers that we'll be uh, representing to ensure that these are quality work placements. But if for whatever reason some of the 30 applications that we make a bid for get rejected, will that mean that all applications get rejected or just the ones that are deemed unsuitable only the ones deemed unsuitable great question great. rob um so yeah, so, yeah. But i thought yeah. better check <laughs> yeah you, you go for 30 you know you, your ambition is is that which is great you know if for whatever reason you know, diligence and otherwise you know some of the stuff falls away from that then you know, or or then drops out then you know, yeah that, that we will still see that as a sustainable bid yeah fantastic thank you and the second question is more from a tax perspective. And um, given all the, all these payments will be coming through the gateway organisation, will they be classed as taxable income for corporation tax purposes by HMRC? 
oh, that's not an area of expertise for me. Um, uh, I know that they were VAT exempt, um, but let me take that away and find that out for you. Thank you very much. Oh, we're not sure. Sorry, Sorry go, on. go on. Go on, go on. Another, another great, great question. So we'll, we'll take we'll take that one. Um, we'll take that one away. I suspect there'll be a number of these that that could. Can I bring in um, Mark Curry? Mark, Mark, could you could you introduce yourself first, please? Yeah. Um, good afternoon, Matt. Mark Curry from Mantra Learning. Um, a couple of points. The simple, first one's quite simple. Um, can an employer uh, be with more than one gateway company? And I'm obviously um, looking at the comments that Mo made about the, the feeding fest that could, could occur both from people inside GM uh, and the GM family and outside the GM family and indeed large national organisations. And I think that then takes, so in addition to that question, it also brings up more thoughts on just what the process might be. So if, 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 if firm gateway companies were advertising on the on social media for argument's sake um, their wares and they would then have to refer people into DWP and be what DWP would then make a decision on what that individual was going to be doing in terms of being referred back to that that, that gateway company um, so there's going to be a process issue on how that referral process works so two questions for you Matt one, one about the process and how that will be controlled and 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 to this business of uh, can an employer, can a small employer be with one more, more than one gateway company? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Two two good questions there. So I'll, I'll so I'm sure Garrett will, will will correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. But in terms of of a company being using more than one more than one gateway, I suppose each if a company had ten jobs, there'd be no reason why five of those jobs couldn't be with go via one gateway and five via another. Is is there or or or, or correct me if that's if that wouldn't be the case. Uh, no, that, that's that's right, Matt. Um, yeah. The question for me is why why we would want to do that. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, and in some circumstances that could be uh, mark the fact that you know, gateway organisations, and I think it goes back to to Grace's question actually about you know, at what point can you flex your bid upwards by way of new interest, right? And at what point does a a new application uh, or what at what point is a new application required? So it may well be that you know, this could happen, couldn't it? Because what you've got is an organisation who is going to place that five in Matt's example um, and then decides to, I want to recruit another five. But the, the gateway that they were working with is not in a bidding phase because they're in a delivery phase and they're not yet ready to bid for the next round of jobs. But a neighbouring gateway is ready to bid and they want to bring those jobs to the market quickly absolutely no issue with doing you know doing that and going across a number of agency type gateways and then in terms of that feedback feedback loop if jobs are create in effect there's an intermediary and that is the job that's then posted with dwp what's the feedback loop from jcp to the intermediary or is there is there a feedback loop between jcp and the intermediary or just jcp and the end employer Right. Okay. So let's, let's work this one through because I didn't quite get the question. So, um, so is this about um, when the vacancy is placed and when we're talking about who the successful candidate is and you know, how that feedback loop occurs? I, I think so. And also, and, and Mark will 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 come in if I kind of mis misrepresented this, but also um, if that because you'll have um, you've got an end employer. You've got an intermediary who is posting those those vacancies with Job Centre Plus. In that, in the in the rest of that process, what role, if any, does the intermediary have yeah, in, in that? Yeah, fine. Yeah, fine. Yeah, so, so the way it'll work is, if I'm the gateway, um, you know, I've bid, you know, I've you know been deemed a successful. The next phase is that I'll be asked to to gather the the vacancy spec for each of the employers that I'm representing. Which will also then include the the scheduling for those jobs as to you know, when we would want them to appear in comparison to when we want them competed for in comparison to when we want to see them started. What will then happen is you know, that team will you know, populate the the jobs board. You know, that will then pop up in a job centre and be available to our work coach community. At that point, um, I think what will happen is that our employer advisor community sat in job centres, and I'm sure some of you would be familiar with that community. So 
you know, each job center has a team of employer advisors who you know, work across you know, small and medium enterprise and large business in terms of filling vacancies. We'll create a direct relationship with the employer rather than the gateway organization to ensure that the, the end to end in terms of the referral and competition route is as good as it can be right the way through to the point where you know, we can help with batching of applications, you know, create an assemblance of order, you know, funnel in the content, etc. And then to confirm who is successful and then corroborate the fact that that young person has then started in work. In terms of what then happens in terms of triggering the payment at this point, we're still working that through in terms of what are we looking for by way of checks and balances for audit purposes. And, and how does that then occur in terms of you know, the, the employer has to notify the gateway, the gate, gateway is notifying DWP. That part of the process is yet to be defined, Matt. But in terms of the, the relationship on the ground for filling vacancies, I think the DWP local office will have a direct relationship with the end employer. OK, thanks. Thanks for that. And, and, and again, that's where with the relationship we have in Greater Manchester, with that with our local JCP team and, and the board, we can play it. We could play a, a supporting a supporting role in, in that to ensure, I suppose, the comms is, 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 is as is as clear and, and, and concise as possible. Mark, just, just make sorry, a is that Mark? Yeah, come, yeah, of course, come again. Yeah, Mark. What I was going to say was, it'd be really, really helpful for um, DWP to publish that process in the detail as soon as possible. Um, to prevent poor behaviour and make sure that people who are new to the system, in fact, we're all going to be new to the system, um, don't 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 act in, in a poor fashion. Um, just a note, uh, Matt, a number of people on this call won't be able to get the chat. I certainly can't get the chat. And we have had Teams meetings before where we haven't been able to put the chat in, so it's not been possible to post questions and stuff like that. OK, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, and we'll, we'll we'll ensure that as much as possible. I mean, today's today's been 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 recorded, but as you say, there are questions which are on the in the chat which haven't been answered yet. Uh, we will look to respond to to those as much as as much as possible. And um, just conscious of the of the of the time, I'll probably take take what one more one more question, and then and then we'll need to start wrapping up. So I think um, Reet Dalu was the next person with the hand up. Could you introduce uh, yeah. yourself first, please? Yeah, Reet Dalu from the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce. Um, we are looking to act as a gateway. Um, we have um, about 30 placements, so we're ready to put our application in. But I just wanted to understand a little bit more about what information would um, be required from us to evidence that these are new roles. OK, yep. So, so uh, guidance around the kind of evidence evidence requirements, and I think that's that's come up a few a few times in the in the questions uh, in the question today. So because of that that fundamental question, how will how will DWP um, take uh, and the intermediaries, I suppose, uh, take a take a view of whether something is genuinely um, new or not? So yeah. Garant, I think I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're on the call today, Garant. No, you're fine, Matt. And um, afternoon, Reed. Uh, great question. Uh, yeah, it's. It's going to be very difficult, isn't it? That you know, that's the truth of the matter, right? You know, obviously, you know that you know, from a DWP perspective, you know the form itself, you know, right up front, you know, talks about a number of toggle box responses, right, that confirm the fact that the job is new and that it's not displacing or replacing, or you know, have some recent redundancy history attached to it, right? Um, they will also then ask you know, through the application form about you know, talk about you know, where these jobs have come from and, and how are they new. In terms of new, what we're not saying is they need to be you know, new in terms of name or novel in terms of delivery. Right? They, they can be the same jobs. They could just be more of them, couldn't they? Right. So if you use, for example, a, a restaurant, and I'm not quite sure many restaurants will be recruiting this side of Christmas, unfortunately. Um, but if a restaurant has normally 10 people who work the front of house, and that's their business model, but they think that you know, they have the ability to take on you know, two young people from a kickstart perspective and you know, make that 12, you know, because that provides experience for that young person and potentially augments the experience for the, the person entering the restaurant, then those would be classed as new jobs. At the point of where you know, that 10 becomes eight because two people leave and they want to replace, but they always have intent to have 10, 
then recruiting two from Kickstart to create 10 would not be the right thing to do because that, in essence, would be backfilling for you know, the, the attrition that, that that organization sees. I think that this is a big risk, Rick, if I'm truthful. Right? It's a risk for the gateway organization, it's a risk for the employer, and it's a risk for DWP that we, to some degree, all take responsibility for because... The risk is, isn't it, is that you know, an intermediate labour market model, for, you know, and this is exactly what that is, you know, for it to work well and have the impact it has to have, it needs to be as clean as it can be. Um, and if it's not, then it doesn't have the economic benefits that we suggest it needs to have. But also potentially it brings with it, doesn't it, that damage in intent in terms of the way that it could be portrayed by others. And therefore, I just think that you know, gateways and employers from a, a conscience perspective have a real part to play in making sure that, that this isn't abused in the way that's suggested. Matt, can I just add to, to Geraint's point? Absolutely, Mo. I may. Just a, it's a personal ask, really, and a personal plea to, as much as we say to employers, do not abuse the system and want this to be used as being well I can take somebody off zero hours and you know put another young person in for six months for free you know we may even embark through the border a, a good gateway charter that you know and and we've had you know Bolton at home read from Greater Manchester Chamber I'd hope that all gateway organizations who are seeking to do this intervention and, and be part of this program can play on the trusted relationships they have with employers and that's why they're going because those employers trust them and they have a pre-existing relationship and therefore they are, they know and trust that, that that delivery will be good. The other thing I would say to my employer colleagues and my business colleagues is to say I would personally focus on people who have an understanding of your locale, who are in your locale, are playing a part in the economy of your locality and therefore you are going to be able to actually maximize that opportunity because if you're going to play a bridge role as an employer those are the people who could then potentially then work with other businesses in the area who could potentially employ them on a more permanent basis so take the power as a business and an employer i would empower myself and you know us at <clears throat> greater manchester through the board and ca we will have you know people we know we trust in those localities that we could signpost to as gateway organizations and vice versa but i would just implore gateway organizations to if you're going to go into this enterprise build on the trusted relationships with the employers don't come in to just see an opportunity and start doing some you know business development activity with people and companies that you may not have any relationship with and essentially that would may prejudice somebody like Bolton at home, like the Chamber, like uh, Nick from Stockport, who have trusted relationships with them. Thanks, Matt. No, thank you. Thank you, Mo. Now, I'm going to have to uh, wrap up uh, this part of the, the, of the session now and just, uh, and, you know, thanks so much for, for so many questions. And it's and, and, and apologies if, if we didn't answer everybody's, everybody's questions with their with 150 or so people on the um, in, 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 on this kind of webinar today, that, that was always going to be a, a tall a tall order. Um, but we are we do want to ensure that we that we do answer as many as many as as possible. Um, Katie, could you just put up the, the the slides, please, for the for the to kind of wrap the session up. Um, so um, I think there've been a few questions already about about the event. So it has been it has been recorded. It is going to be posted on the on the uh, GMC and let and let websites. Um, we're asking people to leave their contact details in, in the chat um, if they'd like to get some more information about it. Uh, we'll also provide an email an email address for people to get it to get in touch in touch with. Um, we will be be kind of closing off this chat function after after the session. We can leave it open for for a short for a short while. Um, but it, but it will be it will be switched off on the um, on on Tuesday, um, and we won't be we won't be answering any queries via this this channel after after that. Uh, but if you got if you're happy to to give your contact details now, then please please drop them please drop them um, in there and just move on to the 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 last slide, Katie. And um, so. If you've got any any further further information, we are working really closely with our with our kind of job centre plus teams on on the ground, and we're working really collaboratively on, on this. So so please please do get in touch with us for more more information at uh, gm.kickstart.dwp.gov.uk. I just want to kind of uh, kind of finish today by saying thanks so much to to Mo 
uh, Elizabeth and, and Geraint for their for their contributions. Um, absolutely fantastic. And, and thanks so much to everybody, everybody attending, just for so many questions and for such positivity about this programme. And so many kind of re really quality questions, which is about how to make this su a success, which I know we all we all want to do. So thank you so much for your for your time. Um, thanks for your uh, involvement in today. And uh, and let's go and make Kickstart a success in Greater Manchester. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.